next speakers are Brian Mink and Joe Sutherland. Brian Mink is a practicing attorney at Troutman Sanders LLP in Atlanta. Brian is trained as a commercial real estate lawyer and regularly counsels developers and users of real estate across a variety of industries in acquiring, developing, and negotiating tax incentives for complex commercial real estate transactions. Brian has represented clients in some of the largest technology-driven transactions in Georgia and the United States, including a $42 billion data center that recently broke ground in Metro Atlanta. The transaction was cited at by the Atlanta Business Chronicle is one of the largest economic development transactions in Georgia history. Brian is also the founder and chief architect of a contract automation and contract analytics program at Troutman Sanders, which aims to optimize contract risk and performance and improve efficiency by automating contract drafting and giving structure to previously unstructured contract text. Brian is a member of Troutman Sanders Innovation Working Group and the firm's Technology and Information Systems Committee. He also serves on the advisory board of Data Science Connect and Data Science ATL, and is an adjunct professor at the University of Georgia School of Law. Brian received his law degree from the University of Virginia School of Law, graduated with honors from the University of Georgia, and completed Lean Six Sigma Green Belt training at Georgia Tech. Joe Sutherland, is an expert in leading groundbreaking technological initiatives by building or supporting a data science team to deliver lasting results. A career in technical and managerial roles at venues including the White House, FinTech, Columbia, and Princeton help him to represent both the front and back offices. His academic research published in top peer-reviewed outlets leverages predictive modeling on structured and unstructured data to make behavioral inferences. PhD and MA at Columbia, BA at Washington University in St. Louis. Please welcome Brian Mink and Joe Sutherland. Good morning, I'm Brian Mink. I'm an attorney at Troutman Sanders here in Atlanta. I'm gonna be talking with Joe Sutherland today about how to optimize contract risk and performance using automation and text analysis. So the first thing you're probably wondering is, why is an attorney speaking at a data science conference? And this is really the reason why, and actually I think the slide got a little uh, formatting messed up, but 81% of senior executives say they want data to be at the heart of all their decision making. So not just one factor in some decisions, but at the heart of all of their decision making. And as a lawyer, these are our clients, our senior executives of corporations. And there's a big problem for us as attorneys looking at a statistic like this, and that is that there is one major area in which senior business executives have very little insight from data, and that is their contracts. These are large, long documents with vast amounts of unstructured text uh, and complex legal terminology that doesn't make sense to most lay people. So contracts are the backbone of all business transactions. And as I said, executives have no idea what's in most of their contracts and no way to gain insight from data into these contracts. So contracts establish expectations between the parties. They set key deadlines. They determine who gets paid and when and under what circumstances. And they create legally binding obligations. So as you can imagine, these are significant documents that have a major impact on any type of business transaction that you engage in. And companies spend a lot of money hiring lawyers to negotiate what's in these contracts. And if something goes wrong, ultimately hiring other lawyers to litigate what went wrong and determine what the contract language meant and what the parties intended. So all of these are contract risks. So that means what happens if the other party breaches the contract? Which, what's your remedy? What happens if your company breaches the contract? What kind of remedies does the other party have against you? What happens if external circumstances change? So for instance, if the global economy collapses and what you contracted for is no longer worth the same amount, can you get out of the contract? Can another party get out of a contract that you've entered into with them? 
These are all significant risks in any business. They're all contract risks. And as attorneys, we try to mitigate these risks. So that's how you mitigate these risks is you hire a lawyer. And specifically, I'll just kind of break down since I'm probably the only attorney in the room or one of the only attorneys in the room. Uh, there's several different types of law. Uh, and so I want to be clear about which one we're talking about today. So we're not really talking about litigation. Uh, that's when two parties are suing each other. It's an adversarial context. And, uh, you know, contracts are heavily involved in litigation as well. But today we're going to be talking about actually negotiating and, and analyzing the risk inherent in a contract at the front end. Uh, we're not talking about regulatory law, which is basically rules and regulations of government compliance. What we're focusing on is transactional law, so the legal obligations and documents that are associated with any type of business transaction. So what I deal with in my practice are commercial real estate transactions. So anytime a party wants to buy or sell a piece of property, they want to lease some space in a building. Uh, I've done a lot of work on data centers. So if a client wants to buy a piece of land and build a data center on it, uh, we'll be involved in that type of transaction. And as commercial real estate attorneys, we negotiate contracts. We counsel clients on what their contract risks are. And we ultimately, if everything goes according to plan, we close the transaction, meaning we coordinate the exchange of signed contracts and the money uh, to actually consummate whatever the business deal was. So I'm going to give you an example of how data could play into the contract risks that we deal with as commercial real estate attorneys. So this is actually a real world example that I experienced on a transaction. Uh, frequently in the buying and selling of land, the seller will have certain obligations to perform construction work as part of uh, part of the deal before the buyer's obligated to buy the property. So in this particular case, our seller had to demolish an existing building that was on the property, and then they had to remove the footings and foundations that were in the soil and then grade the land so that our client could come in and actually put a building on the property. Uh, the problem with this was that when our client got out to do the work, they sent their contractor out to lay the foundation and they discovered that there were these wooden piles that were left in the ground from a prior building that had not been removed. And, and there were 150 of these and the cost to remove them was a little over $8,000. So immediately they come to us and they say, what's in the contract? Do we have, can we go after our seller? Can we make them fix this? And thankfully, we had exactly what we were supposed to have in the contract. We hadn't watered down any of our contract language or negotiated it. And so what this provided for was a pretty standard market remedy, which is uh, we give notice to our seller. They've got to fix it within 15 days. And if they don't fix it, then we can come in and do it ourselves and they have to reimburse us. Uh, so the problem with that in this case was that we didn't have 15 days. Our general contractor would have had to stop work in order for this to occur and it would have thrown off the entire schedule. We would have lost a lot more than $8,000 if we waited on our seller to do this. So our client said, fine, just, we'll just go ahead and do it. And hopefully we can get the seller to pay us back, notwithstanding what's in the contract. Uh, so in this instance, we came back to the seller. They said, fine, we'll pay you, but we're only gonna pay you $6,300 instead of $8,000 because our contractor says they could do it for $6,300. So our client incurred about a $2,000 loss as a result of this contract language. There was nothing wrong with the language, uh, but they incurred a $2,000 loss. So the question is, should we, going forward on all their contracts, cut this period from 15 days to something less than that? Could we cut it to two days notice, and then we have the ability to step in and do the work ourselves? Or could we provide that uh, if we've already started construction, that we have the right to go in and do it ourselves and don't have to give any notice. And I'll, I'll just say, those are not market standards. And so if we were to change our contract language to that, we would have to heavily negotiate it. We would incur a lot of attorney's fees to do that. Uh, and we may have to give up other things in the contract if we want to dig in on that. And so this really is a data problem. It, it's a question of how big of a risk is it to have this market language in there, this 15-day notice and cure period, as it's called, versus having some other language. Uh, and you could imagine on both sides, there would be situations where uh, the costs might outweigh the benefits. And this is really, it's a quantifiable question. We should be able to answer it with data. But unfortunately, we're not able to do that. And you look at the way that other industries evaluate and quantify risk, and the legal industry is 
remains one of the few that is sort of exempt from this. Uh, car insurance premiums, insurance companies calculate a driver's likelihood to be in, involved in a car accident and the risk of loss, and they bake that into the car insurance premiums. Uh, in the commercial mortgage industry, a buyer's risk of default, a, a borrower's risk of default is baked into the interest rate in their mortgage. And even when we go to the pump, uh, futures, oil futures, determine the price that we pay at the pump because we look at future supply and demand risks, and that determines the price that we pay. In legal transactions, we are not pricing contract risk into our business transactions. Instead, what we're doing is evaluating using professional judgment of legal experts. And this typically includes knowledge and experience. So our knowledge is what we learned in law school, what we learned from the bar exam, on the job training, and our experience is limited to prior transactions that we've been involved in, prior transactions that our colleagues have been involved in, or tribal knowledge, and EQ are basically our understanding of the parties involved and our assessment based on that, based on intuition of what we expect the outcome to be. The problem with using this type of expert judgment is we have a very small sample size. So we're limited to just what we've experienced, what our colleagues have experienced, and this leads us to cognitive biases. So we experience confirmation bias, where we look for uh, facts that are in line with what we already believe to be true. We experience availability heuristics. I mentioned that example with the, the foundation that was left over from the prior building. Well, now I might think that that's a common risk in my contracts and think that that's a risk we need to account for in all of our contracts going forward. It may very well be the case that that only occurs one out of a thousand times and that the risk of loss is extremely low. And so in that instance, uh, our cognitive biases, that availability heuristic will lead us to a faulty conclusion. We also have agency problems. And as lawyers, we're very risk averse and we're paid to be risk averse. And our clients, as business people, make judgments on different bases. They, they want to make judgments based on data and based on the actual likelihood that something's going to happen. And so when we, as lawyers, experience a negative outcome, we're going to try to prevent that in future contracts, even if, uh, quantifiably, that's not the right thing to do. And finally, there's little accountability for bad judgments. So no one's keeping score. Because we don't have structured contract data, no one's keeping score of all the times we were right and all the times we were wrong. It's just too difficult to do if you don't have a spreadsheet, if you don't have something to give some structure to all these vast paragraphs and documents that are uh, enshrining our clients' legal obligations. So the reason, as I said, why we can't quantify risks in the legal industry like other industries quantify risk is because we are taking very precise business and legal terms and we are storing them in a very imprecise text-based, unstructured contract medium. And that is, you know, we're taking the structure that we are given initially and we're putting onto that some very legitimate things that are legally binding obligations that we need to put onto these uh, business and legal terms, uh, but we're in the process losing that structure and losing the ability to quantify and evaluate risk. So if we were going to structure contract data, how would we do it? And this is what I've spent a lot of time working on in the last year is to give structure back to contract data by going from inputs to outputs. So developing automation tools so that on a going forward basis, we can have structured data on the one hand that enshrines our business and legal obligations. And then we have the legal terms that we need on the other hand that are outputs that are not structured data. So that's how you could do it on a going forward basis. But the problem is this is very time consuming and it requires a human expert. So it requires someone to actually go through the contract language and determine what inputs go with what outputs and to build some type of automation tool. And very few attorneys have the ability to do that, have any type of expertise in data or technology in addition to their legal expertise. So I've talked to Joe, who's a text analytics expert, and said, Joe, I have a text analytics problem. How do we take all of this unstructured legal text and derive structured, in, structured data so that we can give our clients insight into what is in their contract and what their risks are. And so Joe's gonna tell you in a second about all the ways that you could use text analytics to evaluate what's in your contracts. And I'll tell you 
the current state of contract data, just to set the stage for this, is there are some pros and some cons if you're going to analyze this uh, using text analytics. On the one hand, we've got primarily legible contracts that are contained within Word documents. They're sorted by section. Uh, they use similar phrases to refer to the same concepts. Uh, so that's all positive. That's all something that you could use if you were going to analyze the documents using text analytics. But on the other hand, we've got a very small sample size because we've got lots of narrow verticals within the law. Even within commercial real estate, you've got commercial leases, retail leases, you've got industrial leases, you've got office leases, and all these different types of leases alone have various different types of provisions. So you can't generalize necessarily from one document type to the next. They're also we're also using highly specific, client-specific forms and language that are tailored to specific clients. So if you had a McDonald's and a Chick-fil-A, may want very different things in their contracts, even though they are both uh, fast food restaurants. And finally, the language that you're actually looking at when you analyze a contract using text analysis is not guaranteed to be best practices language. It's frequently negotiated language. So if we're going to take that text and use it on a going forward basis to predict what we should do in our contracts, we may end up with suboptimal outcomes because we're going to be using language that has been negotiated over time and is now, uh, it's not necessarily the best language that we could use. So predictive is not necessarily prescriptive. So now Joe's going to talk to you about how you would approach this from a text analytics perspective. And my mic. Oh, great. Um, hey, everybody. I think uh, in things like this, it's really important to state your priors. And so I'm definitely not a lawyer. I do not know much about contract law. What I do know is a little bit about data science and economics. And so when we think about these partnerships, I think this is a really big, important point. When you think about these industry partnerships, data scientists like us, we know a lot of stuff. We know how to do a lot of things with data science. But something that's really hard is actually applying that data science to industry-specific and domain-specific applications. And so that's what I really like about this partnership. Brian knows the law. I know the data science. Let's make some magic happen. So just a little bit about my background. You know, I've spent most of my career trying to predict the policy decisions that people are going to make as a function of the speeches that they have gave. And so one good example of this is kind of when Janet Yellen gives a speech, what will we predict monetary policy rates to be, and what will we uh, predict bond rates and sort of the monetary uh, sort of fiscal outcomes to be as a function of that language. So this is kind of where some of the, uh, some of the work that we've done has been published, you know, Financial Times, Wall Street Journal, uh, Quartz, and, and this is kind of the idea that we're going for. How do we use NLP to do some sort of forecasting or prediction? And I want to th you know, think about this, this problem, just give a little bit of a background. So it, when we think about text analysis, it's not necessarily anything that's too new. And so text analysis itself um, act, you know, goes way back. It goes back to the medieval times. And so back in like the 1400s, you know, so the 15th century, we have a bunch of monks who were assigned by the Catholic Church to begin systematically reading through pamphlets in every single county in, in Europe and basically try to tabulate and predict the, uh, the anti-church sentiment in that county so that they could go back and then try to you know, basically uh, account for that. And so you have all these monks who are systematically reading through all these texts. They're saying, oh, this is a good text. This is a pro-church text. This is an anti-church text. And uh, at the end of this, this, this exercise, you have a, a great metric for where uh, pro and anti-church sentiment exists. And so this is kind of just a bunch of monks reading these manuscripts back in 1400. And the difference is that today we have computers. And so instead of monks, we had these rooms of experts who would read all these documents and then they would uh, you know, put these sort of document reading ability into a computer. The computer would scale this out using you know, data science techniques, and this would reduce our costs and time to completion. That's the difference between the medieval ages and today. It's not necessarily about the type of analysis that's being done. It's more about the scale. And so we think about this prediction problem. As a data scientist, you think, what Y are we trying to predict as a function of X? So you know, Brian put these up here. We're trying to take these inputs and predict these contract provisions. I would switch that. I would say that instead, we're trying to predict risk of loss as a function of the unstructured text data that are in contracts. So these could be provisions, sections, other types of things, but we really want to predict that risk as a function of the unstructured text data. One question that we might substantively be interested in would be, what would the risk be if we changed this provision? So that's one causal question we might be interested in. Another one might be, if we used, uh, or if we, if we want to achieve our optimal risk, what 
provisions would we want to put into the contract to achieve that optimal risk? So those are two questions that we can answer using these techniques. And so a little bit uh, about unstructured and structured data. I know there's a lot of data scientists in the room, but I think this is useful for the people who aren't familiar with what unstructured data is. Unstructured data is sort of like a pile of Legos. It's a bunch of text data. It's about 80% of the, world, uh, the world's data available today. And all this data, we need a way to reassemble this into something that kind of could fit in like a CSV spreadsheet, something that makes sense. And so the techniques of data science and NLP as applied to unstructured data are to take this pile of Legos and build it back into a building that actually makes sense. And that's pretty much what we're doing. The big question is what methods do we use to structure this? So there's of course two methods. Automated content analysis can be done through supervised learning. So in the supervised learning context, we're trying to take all these contracts, you know, some are good, some are bad, some are suboptimal. We put those into a model and then we use the model to predict what un, you know, un, unobserved, uh, unstructured data might predict for that contract. So we have a new contract, we haven't had an expert read it, we use the model, we predict what it might actually be. Now, the big question is who's coding for these? Who are the experts that are producing these codes on these documents? And, and how can we quantify risk of loss or other types of risks that are associated with contracts? Uh, you know, we might, if we can't get these codes, so if we don't know who's coding for these, we might go to an unstructured, uh, you know, sort of unsupervised uh, learning, learning framework. And these algorithms will take these documents, it'll look for kind of, you know, commonalities across certain documents, and it'll produce clusters. So, you know, this might be the good cluster, this might be the bad cluster, this might be the, you know, the sort of suboptimal cluster. But the big question is then again, what do the experts say about those clusters? Are those clusters actually meaningful? And can we use those to achieve some sort of business, uh, you know, actually some sort of business outcome that's, that's uh, more optimal? So when you think about the feature engineering that needs to go into this, this is for the data scientists in the room, the big question is how do we pick those right features? You know, how do we pick the right contracts or language or provisions that need to go into that contract to predict risk? Uh, you know, we might be interested in theoretically driven features, and so I'll talk a little bit about how red lines might, you know, help us indicate that. We might be interested in informative features by collapsing over all this sparse data. That, that's the big problem of NLP is collapsing information over sparse data. And so, you know, a few feature engineering tricks for, le uh, for legal uh, language. Legal language is very specific. We might be interested in using part of speech tagging to produce better features. Um, you know, we might be interested in lexical diversity, so there's a little bit of research that shows that people who are trying to obfuscate things in contracts uh, actually use more complex language, and so we might be looking for something like that uh, to predict risk. But the big thing that's here, and I think this is the interesting thing about the data set, is the fact that we have how the negotiated language has evolved over time as part of a red line. So if you don't know what a red line is, we think about track changes in Microsoft Word. This is basically you send a document that you've written, somebody else changes something, it tracks what they changed, they send it back to you, and you can see what the differences actually are. Now, if we can uh, take those, treat them as a, a time series of unstructured data, then we can see how the language has evolved over time and use machine learning methods to identify salient contract uh, you know, provisions and other sorts of link, you know, legal things that I'm not too familiar with, uh, you know, and, and uh, predict uh, risk as a function of those time series features. Uh, when we think about, you know, reducing the dimensionality of this, you know, giant feature matrix, because we take all these features out, we take all this unstructured data, we, we blow this into a giant matrix, how do we actually reduce that down to the things that matter? We have supervised learning techniques and a few unsupervised learning techniques, but the one I want to really highlight here is the ability to use a lasso or maybe a multinomial inverse regression to be able to optimize the features that we select with respect to the risk that's associated with those contracts. So those are the types of features and contract provisions that we'll like to be choosing. Now this wouldn't be an NLP talk in 2018 unless we didn't talk about word embeddings. And so I, I wanna just you know, uh, use a, a quick application of word embeddings you know, to something like this. And so something that's really cool about word embeddings is that you can cluster things that are similar. And so if we're looking for sort of provisions and, and, uh, provisions and uh, other types of uh, language that are similar to each other, we can look at uh, we can use the word embeddings for those sections or those words to cluster out and say, oh, okay, here's a cluster of language that looks similar that people might not otherwise really care about. You know, kind of like this idea that you might use a different type of language, but uh, you know, the, the other party won't really care. However, that language might actually be associated with lower risk. And so if you use these clusters, you can optimize uh, the risk by, by choosing the best you know, provision or word from within that cluster to reduce risk or you know, see how it might have increased risk. So this is kind of a cool application I think that we could go somewhere with. Now, backing back out to the business applications, you know, kind of like taking a higher level view, in my experience, I've, I've observed that if you give people just one option to choose from, uh, it turns out that they really hate the option. So you say, hey, I had a machine, it did this prediction, we think this is what you should do. And they say, hey, I'm much better than that machine, 
I don't think that what you're predicting is actually the right thing. I would have done it this way. I would have done it that way. And people just get really frustrated, so they don't want to use the product. The alternative is to produce three options that the machine predicted, maybe in ranked order. All of a sudden, they're very happy. They think, oh, I can pick which option the machine likes, and oh, it's actually option two. I still brought my expert, you know, expertise to the table, but the machine helped me. You know, so it just made my job easier. This is one really good, uh, you know, sort of recommendation. I, I found a lot of success with this. Another big challenge here is that the data sets that we have are very, very small, at least on a domain-specific basis. And so when you're thinking about collecting data, if you want to, imp if you want to be implementing this you know, artificial intelligence project maybe three months from now, you're, you're, you're too late. You need to be collecting that data six years ago. The data that you're going to use to start you know, predicting risk or something domain-specific for you has to come from experts because that's where the information is coming from. And this piece about client specificity, what may work in one situation may not work in another, and you know, these big data sets that are out there for legal language that might be coded by some sort of you know, domain-specific uh, circumstance but does not include best practices language is going to give you subpar results. And so the thing that you need to start doing right now if you're thinking about implementing, at least in the contract space or other industry spaces, um, if you're thinking about implementing AI, is starting to collect that data. And the big piece here is be smart about the data that you collect and how you structure it. Because you don't want to go back five years from now and say, oh, wow, we should have been collecting those variables instead. You know, now, kind of summing this back up, why do we hire experts? It's because you trust their judgment. It's because uh, you, know, you, you, can, you get that kind of soft touch from them, like you, know, you kind of like have a, a rapport that happens. You feel like you're making the best decision. But the problem with experts is they only see a little slice of the world. So if you imagine seeing uh, that you have a, uh, let's just imagine an expert, he has a flashlight. He's in the dark, you're in the dark, you're in the world, but you have a really good flashlight. You could see your little, own little corner of the world. You know every single nook and cranny of that little corner, but you don't actually see the rest. And so if you were to turn the lights on in this room, you'd see a room full of experts, all with their own flashlights, all looking at their own little corners. And what AI is doing is not necessarily making any expert's job just cheaper and faster. What it's really doing is turning the lights on so that all of us can share the information together. And after doing that, we can free up the humans to actually be focusing on the human tasks that the computers can't do. Uh, thank you.